No, it's not going to do the intro. All right. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome. Happy Sunday. It's the day that the Lord made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. You know, um, I'm always excited about every opportunity that I have to share the too good to be true news of God's unconditional love and unlimited grace. I, I, I never take this opportunity for granted. And, um, and I have to tell y'all, you know, that this is really, you know, people tell me, say, oh, you know, we're blessed by your teaching and this, that, and the other, and, and that's, that's wonderful. But you know something though, there's a blessing for me in this also, because it is like during this time, and like during the time that I do the little videos during the week, that's almost like therapeutic for me. Because in that time, in this time, I'm doing exactly what I'm called to do. And, and when you're doing exactly what you're called to do, there is a rest in that. And, and so no matter how stressful work gets, life gets, bills get, you know, this is my oasis. Now, mind you, Jesus gives me peace all throughout the week. And I and I have I have peace because of that. But there's something special about this particular moment in time. For me. For me. Can't talk about y'all because I don't want to make y'all mad, but it works for me. <laughs> Amen. So let's pray. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you and praise you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it goes forth with boldness, simplicity, and power. Thank you that it ministers grace to our hearing, Lord, and love to our minds and to our hearts. And Lord, that it fills us up to we're overflowing, Lord, that we're able to go out and tell somebody else about how much, how richly, how extravagantly you love them and that they, uh, and how they can come to know you and to love you as well, Lord. And we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we were talking before um, service about running and, and how Angie likes to run. And I have to make a confession that she can run circles around me. Now, I've always been, you know, pretty fast as a sprinter and, and I've always had good endurance. But it was like when we first started uh, walking and running, you know, at first we started, we were kind of like at the same pace, but we kind of got to a point where she just kind of took off and left me, you know, and, and it's okay, you know, because this is what I learned is that, and, and I'm kind of getting ahead of my message here, is that my wife is not my competitor. She, she's my compliment. She's my help me. She's my rib, you know. I'm better because of her. So she's not my competition. So I've learned that when, when she takes off and runs, I celebrate that. I don't get mad that she's leaving me behind. I'm like, hey, get it, girl. <laughs> you know, because that's what we're supposed to do. We should celebrate each other's accomplishments instead of competing with each other. So... I want to tell you guys, like when I first started preaching, this is like uh, about 16 years ago, and I was determined that I was going to be the best preacher there ever was. I was going to preach to the nations. I was going to preach on television. I was going to preach on radio. I was going to be the biggest, best preacher ever. That was, I was determined to do that. But in order to do that, when you say that I'm going to be the best at something, you have to identify your competition. Who are you going to be better than? And there's a problem with that in the body of Christ. There's a huge problem with that because we're not supposed to be competing. We're supposed to be helping, equipping, encouraging, 
edifying each other, not competing. So I, I had to catch a, a revelation. Something had to change in my psyche. And, and let me just say this too. God has a really interesting sense of humor. And, and it's this, that um, in many cases, when it comes to things in ministry, things in the kingdom, God showed me how things are not supposed to be. But a lot of times he didn't tell me that this is how it's not supposed to be up front. You know, he didn't front load the discussion. He put all of that in the back burner because he's like, I, I need you to walk through it and see it for what it shouldn't be before you understand what should be. Right, are you with me? So I want to, um, I'm going to share a couple of passages of scripture with you. And, and it involves running your race. And, and what we're talking about today is, is racing without competition. Oh, that's, that'll really get you. Because, you know, we want to run our race and finish our course. We want to win the prize. But I'm here to tell you that we've seen this completely out of context. And I'm hoping that today, if you give me a few minutes, I'll put it into the proper context for you. And you will run your race effortlessly. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and then... Um, put your finger there and then go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. So Hebrews 12 and 1 and 1 Corinthians 9 and 24. Hebrews 12 and 1 says, Therefore then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance that is unnecessary weight and sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us. And let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, and it reads... Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run your race that you may lay hold of the prize and make it yours. Now, Hebrews 12 and 1 tells us that we have a race to run. And it also tells us that it is a marathon and not a sprint. That this is a race of endurance and not of speed. So we have to have endurance. We have to have patience. We have to have the ability to walk it out. We have a race to run. And I like to think of like in car racing, there was a guy, um, Sir Colin Chapman who was the founder of Lotus Cars. And Colin Chapman had a theory about building race cars. He said, first, add lightness. That sounds really kind of contradictory when you hear it, but he was saying that basically a car doesn't need to be any heavier than it needs to run. In other words, if there's anything that weighs more than it takes for it to run, it's too much weight. And, and likewise, we have to strip aside all of these things that weigh us down. Listen, there are things in your life, people, places, things that will weigh you down, that they will stop you from walking into your destiny. You know, that there is a statistic that says that most people never go beyond 20 miles past the place that they were born that they never live 
more than 20 miles past the place that they were born. This is the majority of people. Those of us who have lived somewhere else and have moved on, you know, because everybody here in this room is not an Arizona native. We all came from somewhere else. But we are the exception and not the rule. Because most people hang out right. Listen, I grew up in Detroit, and I kid you not that there are people from the east side of Detroit that have never been to the west side. There are people from the west side of Detroit that have never been to the east side. There are people from the city of Detroit that have never been past the county line to Oakland County, you know, to the suburbs of Detroit. This is a true thing. People just don't, they, they don't go. But I'm here to tell you that sometimes where you are may be your Egypt. See, I'm from Detroit and I have, I have a great love for the city that I grew up in. But Detroit was Egypt to me. And God gave me three opportunities to leave and not come back. I had to take him up on the third one because the first two, I just didn't get it. I left and I came back. I left and I came back. But, but the third time, if I hadn't left, I would have lost my marriage. It's a true story. So Detroit is, is Egypt. I had to leave Detroit behind in order to walk into my destiny. My destiny was not in Detroit. So sometimes you got to leave places behind. Sometimes it's people. I have a lot of friends, a lot of family. I mean, and not just in Detroit, but all over the country and all over the world. There are some people that, that I love them. I'm always glad to see them, but I cannot be with them on a day-to-day -day basis because they would hold me back from walking into my destiny. And then there are things. You know, uh, I used to like to ride motorcycles. Well, for the sake of my marriage, I had to leave motorcycles behind. I mean, there, there are things. You know, sometimes it, it may be, it may be a, a, a piece of jewelry, or it may be a car, or it may be a building or something like that. It could be anything. It's people, places, or things that you have to leave behind to move on. This is what the author of Hebrews was talking about, laying aside every weight. You got to shed some baggage sometimes. So we have a race to run, and that's certain. But watch this. 1 Corinthians 9 and 24, and this is the one that I, I promise you that if you catch this, this will bless your soul. This will bless you right down to the very quick of your soul. Because 1 Corinthians 9 and 24 tells us that many runners compete, but only one wins the prize. Many runners compete, but only one wins the prize. Now, I don't know about you, but this passage of scripture put me on the religious treadmill big time. Because many run, many compete, but one wins. I was like, man, and, and, and if you know me, I like to win. When it comes to board games, I like to win. When it comes to my career, I like to win. I like to win. I'm not kidding. Now, this is fleshly me. Okay? Fleshly Derek likes to win. But see, spirit Derek has learned a higher lesson. We all compete. But only one wins the prize. And, and what that does is you start running this treadmill, and this is what goes through, uh, this is what went through my little peanut brain was this. If I run this race and I win this prize, when I go to heaven, everybody's gonna look up to me. Because I did it. I achieved it. Or I would fail miserably and I'd be looking up to people who had who had won. Works, action, 
I was, I was yoked to this thing that I had to, if, if, if there were days that, and, and Angie can tell you that, I mean, there, there were days early on in our marriage that if I didn't go out and witness Jesus to somebody, I felt bad. If I hadn't shared this gospel with somebody, I felt bad. Because I'm trying to run this race, y'all. I'm trying to win this prize. Because, see, flesh Derek and spirit Derek, they, they were really closely connected. And so spirit Derek wanted to win, too, because the word said that. Only one wins the prize. And see, if you, if you look at it like that, many runners run, many runners compete. So what you're thinking is, is I've got all of these competitors, all of these other saints, they're all, you know, listen, true story. We were watching the 2008 Olympics when we were living in Arkansas. And there was a guy from the University of Arkansas that was running in this race. And, and he had it. Matter of fact, not only had, would he have won the race, but he would have set a world record time. But when they went back and replayed the video, he stepped on the line. All so subtle, I mean, just barely. He just barely stepped on the line. And why did he step on the line? Because he's looking around at his competition. Instead of running his race, he's looking around, looking to the left, looking to the right. What is everybody else doing? See, that's what that passage of scripture does to people when it's not taken in context. You're going to start looking around, looking around, looking around. And so what happens is, is that instead of winning the race that is set for you to run, you disqualify yourself. Because God doesn't disqualify you. Contrary to popular belief, see, people will say, well, God will disqualify you. God will take you out. No, God doesn't disqualify you. You're qualified in Christ. But you will disqualify yourself because you are running someone else's race. You're not running the race that's set before you. Man, I, I'm going to tell you something. When, when I saw this, this woke up freedom in me in a huge, tremendous Fantastic way. Now, there was a comic strip back in the day called Pogo, and I think I referred to Pogo last week too, but I, I, I love Pogo. Pogo was the story of these woodland creatures who were negotiating their way through human politics what Pogo was all about. It was political satire, but it was woodland creatures that were running for office and doing the different things, right? And, and, and Pogo was something of a, of a pundit. You know, he was an observer. He wasn't involved in anything. He's just an observer. But he had a quote that, that just really resonates with me to this very day. He said, we have met the enemy and he is us. We have met the enemy, and he is us. In other words, your enemy, your competition, your competitor is not, you know, Susie Saint or, 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 or Stephen Saintly. That, 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 no, they, that, that's not your competition. The greatest battlefield in the history of warfare is the six inches between the ears. And all of this information that comes out from all these different sources, from television, from radio, from the internet, from Facebook, from Instagram, from Twitter, all of these things are competing for this vaunted real estate between your ears. That's what they're competing for. They're all fighting for that territory. They all want to plant the flag in the middle of your head and say, this is mine. And not only do all of those different venues are competing, but all of the people who use these venues, they're competing also. 
All the preachers, all the teachers, all the cooks, all the photographers, all the singers, all the actors, all the dancers, they are all competing for your attention and they're all trying to plant a flag in the middle of your head. So watch this. Many run the race, but only one wins. And if we think about that as in, in people, then we're going to look at our brothers and sisters in Christ as competitors instead of compliments. So I want to change the paradigm. I want to shift the paradigm a bit. That all who run the race, it's not people. It's your thoughts. Every thought in your head is running a race in your head competing for a prize at the end of your mind. Every thought. So watch this. When we bring every thought captive and, and into the obedience of Jesus Christ, the idea is See, what, what, what a lot of people think is that this is a works-based thing, that you, you have to work to get uh, you, you have to work to get these thoughts taken captive, that there's something that you have to do. And it isn't even that. I'm going to make it real simple for you. Because when you take a thought captive and bring it to the obedience of Jesus Christ, all you're doing is just saying that thought, I'm not thinking about you. I'm giving you over to Jesus and what Jesus does is he submits it to the Holy Spirit and then the Holy Spirit begins to regulate the thought see this is why in in, uh, in Philippians it says let uh, uh, think on these things that are lovely think of these things that are good think of these things that are pure it you really can't regulate your thoughts to that level because I don't know about you, but it's like my mind, you know, they, they, people say the idle mind is the playground of the devil. That's not scripture, by the way. That's old folklore. But my mind, when, when, it, when it is, you know, just kind of idling and not really in forward progress, I get some really funky thoughts. Y'all do too. Y'all don't want to admit it, but you get some funky thoughts. You know, I mean, who hasn't, who hasn't thought about, you know, getting revenge about something against someone who did you dirty? This is what happens when you have an idle mind. An idle mind starts tending to those kind of thoughts. But what you do is, like, when you find your mind going into those, into those areas, you say, okay, thought, I'm not, I'm not giving you any time. I'm giving you over to Jesus. And what happens is then the Holy Spirit will then regulate what you think of. That's why let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. That's how it happens. See, it says let this mind, let this mind. In other words, you got to give permission for this mind to be in you. It doesn't just happen. You have to let it, permit it, allow it. Man, oh man. The big idea here is this. Don't let your brothers and sisters in Christ be your competition. To use the analogy of a runner, a competitive runner trains a competitive runner eats properly rests properly a competitive runner watches what they think of and, and watch this that when the runner is in the starting blocks and he's getting ready to get out of the starting blocks the hand isn't trying to figure out how to beat the leg. 
The red blood cell is not trying to figure out how to beat the nerves. The eye is not trying to figure out how to beat the foot. That when the starting gun sounds, everything in the runner's body is dedicated to the runner winning. This is how the body is supposed to work. If I am the hand in the body, I'm not trying to outrun the foot. It isn't incumbent upon me to make sure that my hand gets across that finish line before the foot does. That is not the objective. The objective is to run the race and to win. And that means that if I'm part of this body, then that means I have to be contributing to the whole body winning. I have to be contributing to the whole body moving. I have to be contributing to what the body is thinking. I have to be contributing to what the body is eating. I have to be contributing to, to how the body is training. All of these things have to work together. See, this is why when uh, in, in Romans chapter 8, it says all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We are all called according to his purpose. And all things will work together for good if we choose to work together. And I've taught this before, and I, I highly recommend this. If you haven't seen this before, there's a, there's a, a teaching that I did uh, about a year ago called The Body Believes Differently, and it's okay. Because watch this, that in order for me to move Different parts of my body have to agree and disagree. In order for you to walk, there has to be agreement and disagreement. Now, the net result is unity, right? Because even though there is disagreement in the body, the body as a unit moves forward. Are you with me? That even, see, this is where we mess it up in the body of Christ because we think that just because we don't agree on every single thing, well, I just don't, I'm not going to talk to this person anymore because I don't agree with them. Or I'm not going to hang out with these people anymore because I don't agree with their theology. And so I kick them to the curb because that, that no, we are one body. All who say they are Christ are Christ. Now, the, the only place where that gets weird is like when you say that Jesus is the incarnation of the Archangel Michael, or if you say that, that Jesus came down from another planet uh, or something like that. If, if you say that, well, that's outside. That doesn't mesh with Jesus, with, with God's character or nature. And so those, those uh, you know, really far out ideas, you can discard those. I'm not saying that every single thing that somebody says about God is, is good or it's true. But this is what I will say. And, I, and I, I, listen, at this point in my life, I will walk this out to my grave. And it's this, that if it is consistent with God's nature, which is love, and consistent with his character, which is grace, if somebody says something that is consistent with love and grace, even though I may not particularly agree with it when I hear it, I have to believe that there is God working in that. Because some people will say, well, you know, so, talk about this, man. It's like people say, well, I heard from God. Well, if you heard from God, great. You know, what did you hear? And, and if what you heard is consistent with his, with his love and with his grace, then, you know, I, who am I to judge that you didn't hear from God? But if you, if you, if you get a word from God that says, you know, I, you know, I, I want to, you know, kill everyone from the Middle East or everyone that believes in Islam or anything like that, well, that ain't God. That ain't God. You say you heard from God, but God told you to kill somebody. No, you didn't hear from God. That's not consistent with his nature, his character. Or if you if you hear from somebody, God, well, God told me to take this property from these people. No, that, that, that's not God. It's not God.
we, as the body of Christ, have to understand that there is a race that we have to run, that there is a course that we have to pursue. And each one of us, each one of us, our race is our race, and it is our race to win. And here's the good news, the too good to be true news, is that your victory party has already been arranged and that your victory has already been assured. In other words, you started off at the starting gate of the race that you're supposed to run and the fix is in. You are already set. It's already been decreed in your favor. It's already done. You've already been given it. All you have to do is just run. Man, that's, that, that, that is just amazing. And, and then on top of that, you don't have to look to the left or look to the right to see what your brothers and sisters are doing. You, that ain't, matter of fact, that ain't your business. That's their race to run. And that's between them and God. It ain't got nothing to do with you. It ain't got nothing to do with me. Listen, I, I'm going to tell you, you know, like, it, it, especially in ministry, especially in ministry, we have this tendency to compete. Oh, I'm looking for the, the next revelation that's going to set me apart from everybody else. Or I'm looking at this little cliche that I can say that's going to set me apart from everybody else. And that if I do that, more people are going to listen to me. More people are going to come to my church. They're going to fill my pews. They're going to buy my books and all of these other things. And, and we get into competition with each other when instead we should be lifting each other up. You know, this is why I, I buy other people's books. And when I buy their books, I tell people about it. I bought your book. I put it out on social media. I share it with other people. Why? Because it, you know, I, yeah, I got a book and I can promote the heck out of my book. But that's not, you know, that's not the issue. My thing is that I want to see other people. Man, listen, every time I pray about like where God is, is taking me destiny-wise, I say, God, let my coattails be broad and wide so that, so that I can bring some folks along with me. And hopefully that as I'm going along, I'm, I'm standing on somebody else's coattails who are broad and wide, and they're bringing me along. And, and we should be helping each other. Paul wrote to Timothy right before he was about to pass on. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. He, and I'm reading this from the message, and I'm reading it from the message because I like the way it sounds. But he says this, he says, you take over. I'm about to die. My life, an offering on God's altar. This is the only race worth running. And I've run hard right to the finish. I believed all the way. All that's left now is the shouting. God's applause. Hmm. Depend on it. He's an honest judge. He'll do right, not only by me, but by everyone eager for his coming. See, If God had a wallet, your picture is the first one in the sleeve. If God has a mantle over his fireplace, your picture is right on it. Front and center. Yours. Yeah, yours. Yeah. You are God's favorite child. You are God's favorite. And God is at every game, every game you play. He's at every recital you speak at. He's at every choir that you sing in. He's there cheering you on. He's watching you run your race. 
and he's cheering for your victory. He's pointing at you, saying, yeah, that's my baby. And not only that, I'll say this and I'm going to wrap it up, get misty. There was a, a video that made the social media rounds where this young man was out running. He was running in a track meet and he blew out his hamstring. And the boy's father ran out on the track and picked his son up, threw his arm over his shoulder, and walked him across the finish line. See, this is how the body of Christ works. See, the father comes out on the track when he sees that you stumble, and he picks you up, and he's carrying you along, but something else happened that was really extraordinary in this video is that everybody in the stands stood up and applauded. See, this was one guy, but everybody, whether they knew him or not, stood up and cheered for the father that carried his child across the finish line. This is how the body of Christ is supposed to work. We run a race without competitors. Your race is yours to win. It's already been done. Already been taken care of. Already been assured. The victory party is already arranged. But y'all listen. And this is a challenge to each and every one of us and a challenge to the body of Christ. Stop competing. That's not what we're here for. Because I'm going to tell you something. Every day, I see something on social media or on the internet about somebody who says, I, I, I don't want anything to do with, with Jesus because of the way Christians treat each other. As long as we continue, listen, Michael Cheshire said one said something that it, it, it really, he said that Christianity is the only system of faith that eats its wounded. I mean, it's like, you know, people say that Christianity is the only religion that, that people, they shoot their wounded. No, we don't shoot our wounded, we eat them. We consume them. They become our food. And people are watching. The people that don't know Jesus, they're watching. They are watching. And for every time we break out our knife and fork to consume one of our own, the world is watching. And, and just like with any other meal, you think that when you're eating the meal that you're getting bigger and stronger as a result. See, that's the problem. Because people are consuming other people of the same faith and they think they're getting bigger and stronger, but what they're doing is they're actually poisoning the body. They're making the body sick. And we need to stop. We need to stop. That's all I have today. Uh, for anyone that's watching, if, if you don't know it, Jesus as Savior, that today is the day of salvation, and that the Bible says that if you believe in your heart that he lived and he died for us, and that if we confess that with our mouths, then we are saved. And that can happen anywhere. You don't have to be at church. You don't have to be at the altar. It, it, you, you don't have to have a greasy head or the preacher laying hands on you. And all of that's good if that works for you. 
but you don't have to have that. You can get saved in your car, you can get saved in the bathroom, you can get saved in the kitchen, you, you can get saved anywhere, anywhere. So that's, uh, that's pretty much all I have. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for this day. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's gone forth with boldness, simplicity, and power. Lord, thank you that, that someone today has heard something that will allow them, enable them to walk in greater freedom in you, Lord, and that, and that they will know beyond the shadow of a doubt how much you tremendously and ridiculously love them. And Lord, we give you the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God loves you, and so do we. Y'all be blessed.